in our kind of capping off our Christian character series, looking at several events, or several uh, I guess doctrinal teachings in First Corinthians that really distinguish between a person being spiritual and a person being carnal, worldly or fleshly. And the Apostle Paul, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, does a lot to help believers in 1 Corinthians with just how to think. And uh, last week, we really looked at way, the way a believer should think. Um, in verse 7 of 1 Corinthians, I, I meant to say chapter 4, we're not in chapter 5, we see 1 Corinthians chapter 4. Uh, verse 7 of 1 Corinthians chapter 4, last week we saw this statement. For who maketh thee to differ from another, and what hast thou thou didst not receive? Now if thou didst receive it, why dost thou glory? As if thou hadst not received it. Now you're full, now you're rich, you've reigned as kings without us. And I would to God you did reign that we might also, or that we might reign with you. For I think that God hath set forth us the apostles last, as it were appointed to death, or may or made a spectacle unto the world and to angels and to men. Now look down at verse 10. We'll read on down um, just to verse 15 or 16. Now ye are full. I'm oh, sorry. Uh, verse 10. For we are fools for Christ's sake, but ye are wise in Christ. We are weak, but ye are strong. Ye are honorable, but we are despised. Even unto this present hour, we both hunger and thirst and are naked and are buffeted and have no certain dwelling place, and labor working with our own hands. Being reviled, we bless. Being persecuted, we suffer it. Being defamed, we entreat. We are made as the filth of the world, and are the offscouring of all things unto this day. I write not these things to shame you, but as my beloved sons, I warn you, for though you have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet have you not many fathers. For in Christ Jesus, I have begotten you through the gospel. Wherefore, I beseech you that you follow this me. Father, help us this evening as we look at this problem that the church had of following personalities and not Jesus. Lord, looking at men and taking credit for things that really are gifts from you, looking at callings and looking at it as though we are the ones who have called ourselves and not ones who have been called. Father, I pray that you would teach us and instruct us from your word practically this evening how to think about ourselves and how to think about others. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, um, last week we, had, we heard the conclusion that we're not to judge uh, any person. We're not to even uh, judge ourselves. And by the way, not this you know, judge not don't judge anything. In other words, don't determine right or wrong. Don't look at things. But the idea, Paul said, is that he says, you can judge me if you like to. His attitude is, you can judge me if you want to, but I don't judge my own self because we're going to stand before God and every man is going to have his reward. Now, there's a beautiful picture here because right before this, we see the description in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 how that everything that is done in our life is going to be brought before God and everything that is not gold, silver, precious stones is going to burn. So everything that's wood, hay, and stubble is going to burn. And last week we talked about the, you know, if you've heard the speech or the play or presentation of the man who was, you know, woke up and he's in this room and is full of boxes, you know, uh, basically like files full of cards, and on them was everything he'd ever done. That was sin, basically. And as he began to read them, you know, you know, he's basically God's keeping records of everything that you've ever done. And uh, one of the things about that is that everything that we've done, God does know. Everything that we did have done, God uh, records. But everything that we've done in that sense burns. Everything we've done in that sense burns. Thankfully, uh, you are not going to be somewhere, and we are all sitting there as witnesses while God reads everything you've ever thought everything you've ever done. It's, you're not going to be, in the sense, exposed to man because, my friend, you are already exposed to God who is a righteous and just and holy judge. And so your sin is going to burn. That is not going to remain for an eternity. And the reminder here is to live for Jesus because the only thing that remains is the gold, the silver, and the precious stones. And that's exactly why when uh, in verse 
5 when he says, Therefore judge nothing before the time until the Lord come, who both will bring to light the hidden things of darkness and will make manifest or make exposed the counsel of the heart. The Bible says, Then shall every man have praise of God. Now, I don't know about you, my friend, but if everything that's ever been in my heart were made exposed or were shown forth, would you have God's praise? If everything you've ever thought, every motive you've ever had, everything you've ever done, if it were just weighed, and God said, this is exactly what it actually is, what I think it is, what I've judged it to be. And so the fearful, the, not, the, not the warning here, the, the idea here is really more motivational than it is uh, to, for the purpose of causing fear. Listen, friend, you ought to be living for Jesus to have a reward. You ought to be living for God to have a reward. So many times we try to scare people into doing the right thing. Try to frighten people into living for Jesus. And, uh, well, you know, if you don't live for Jesus, then, well, no, friend, it isn't what will happen if you don't. It's what will happen if you do. What will happen if you don't is you'll have nothing. But if you live for Jesus, my friend, you'll have a reward. Aren't you glad that you have a God who actually rewards living for Him? Rewards righteousness. And that's all that will be remembered. And you know that the... 1 Corinthians chapter 3 says some of us, uh, when, when our, everything is burned, the Bible says we'll be saved so as by fire. In other words, we'll be all that's left. When we and everything we've done is burned, all that will survive is us, and that's because of the blood of Jesus. You'll have nothing. That's the future. So we've got to labor to have something for Jesus. It's not wrong to labor to have something for Jesus. You know, so many people invest their lives laboring to have something that lasts for this life. But on the same, on the other hand, they don't labor at all for something that they'll have when they have their ultimate reward. That'll matter for a long time. Everything else is going to burn. You know, it'd be good for you to adopt the phrase and the mindset where you just say it's all going to burn. Because that's the reality. Hey, your home that you're working so hard for, the things that you are investing your time and your attention for, it's going to burn. Uh, it's comforting to me as we work on this building to know that it's going to burn someday. <laughs> it just... It just makes it all okay, doesn't it, Charlie? It's all going to burn. Brother Al didn't put nails in the corner over there on that piece of tram by the, by the water fountain. I let him do it because he's doing it. But uh, you know what? It's going to burn, so don't worry about it. It'll be all right. So he says, if we have an earthquake, we'll have worse problems. We have worse problems than earthquake. It's going to burn. This whole world's going to burn. And it's going to be tried by fire. And friend, the only thing that will survive is what's done for Jesus Christ. We have to keep that mindset. Now, the same thing I want to just it's really, really just a, a one thought and uh, well, I ask some questions to get to the thought, but I just want to look at one thing that the Apostle Paul is sharing as he's telling them. He's saying, hey, you know, no man is to think more highly of, uh, of himself than he ought to think. You've got to be careful not to think better of yourself than you ought to think. That's what verse 6 says, that you might learn in us not to think of men above that which is written that no one of you be puffed up for one against the other. So literally, Paul says, you don't think of me as higher than Apollos. You don't think of Peter as higher than me. You don't think of Apollos as higher than Cephas. You don't rate people on a value basis. You don't rate them on the basis of, well, this is the person I'm following because I think more of this person or because I think less of this person. Paul warns them not to think more highly than they ought to think. Why is that? Well, because look at verse 26 of chapter 1. Get back here real quick because we just have to make one point. Verse, chapter 1, verse 26. Uh, well, let's, let's uh, look at verse 23. But we preach Christ crucified, and the Jews a stumbling block, and of the Greeks foolishness. But unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. Verse 25, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men, for you see your calling, brethren, here we are. For you see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called, but God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty, and base things of the world, and things which are despised hath God chosen. Yea, and things which are not, to bring to naught the things that are, that no flesh should glory in His presence. Now look this way for just a minute. God uses nothings and nobodies to do big things. It's exactly what 1 Corinthians chapter 1 is saying. Listen, there isn't somebody who is great 
There isn't a religious leader who is a great man or a great woman. There is no greatness in men at all. See, the, the Apostle Paul points out, he says, God has, he says that God has chosen the foolish things of the world and the weak things and things which are despised, things that are nothing or not. The, the word actually just means it's just nothings. Nobodies. To bring to nothing things which are, that no flesh should glory in His presence. Now I have on occasion met people that I believe God has greatly used. And it isn't as though I'm a judge of a person. But when somebody has seen people come to Christ and, and souls change, and they've seen a lot of that in their life, I'd say God's greatly used them. I don't think that's complicated. Do you? In other words, we know the Apostle Paul is greatly used of God because he's writing to a church that in 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and uh, verse 15, he says, For in Christ I have begotten you through the gospel. In other words, he's been greatly used of God, and the proof of it is that they've come to Christ. You see. So they're very... The very fact that they have spiritual, that they are spiritually born again, that he's writing to a church that actually exists, shows that God's used him. It's not complicated then, is it, to see whether or not God's used somebody. And I've met some people on occasion that God has greatly used. And one of the things that I don't say anymore, but it seems like if I'm with someone that we're with them, uh, and, and maybe I'll go to lunch with a man that God's used to win souls, or somebody that's well known, or God has done a lot in their life, and many people have come to Christ, many lives have been changed. People would say, he's just a regular guy. You know, he's just a regular person. Sometimes they'll be surprised and say, you know, I, I just, almost disappointed that there wasn't some, woo, something really uh, terrific about that person. You know, like, he, he's, he's not as smart as I thought he was. Uh, he doesn't know proper etiquette at the table. Uh, whatever it is, he's just saying, I thought I'd be impressed by that person, and you're just a regular person. <clears throat> and yet God used them to do great things. And what the Scripture is pointing out is that God does not want flesh to glory in His presence. God takes weak things, He takes poor things, He takes foolish things, and He does great things, so everybody will know God did it. My friend, get over yourself. Get over others. You know, sometimes we have reverse pride, don't we? Sometimes we have the, well, I'm not that person. You know, I just, you know, they just so easily, so naturally talk to people, and I just don't. People just like them, and they don't like me. And it's reverse pride is what it oftentimes is. It's, uh, you almost, it's almost as though you take pride in what you don't do as opposed to what you do. What you do not accomplish as opposed to what you do accomplish. And friend, the point is, is that if God is working, God did it. And if God did it, He deserves the glory. And if He doesn't get the glory, then something is wrong. Okay, so now the Apostle Paul said, he said, now because of this, he said, I'm warning you, don't think of men more highly than you ought to think. In other words, don't think Peter is this, and I'm this. Don't think James is this, and I'm this. Don't compare people. Stop comparing people because your worth and your value, first off, comes from something that you can't take credit for. It comes from the blood of Jesus Christ. Christian, don't compare yourself. Don't compare yourself. Don't try to be better than or less than or greater than. Be what God wants you to be. Serve the Lord Jesus Christ and recognize that God can do anything with nothing. A lot of times I say God can do anything with anyone. But you know what? The reality is God can do anything with nobody. God can do anything with nothing. And so if that's you, you're qualified. I find that to be extremely encouraging, don't you? Isn't it great that God can take a church like Fort Lauderdale Baptist Church and we can see people change, saved and lives changed? You know, there's not any terrific people here at Fort Lauderdale Baptist Church. They're my favorite people in the world. I love this place. I love this. This is my favorite church. I've been in a lot of great churches. I know a lot of great people. in some wonderful places. But this is, my, this is just my favorite place. It's got a place in my heart. And I just think it's the best. You know, I think every pastor should think that. But you know, God's done some great things even here, hasn't He? We've seen God do great things. We've seen people saved even in this room. Isn't that wonderful that God has used us and God has done some things? We've seen God move. We've seen God work. It has nothing to do with our greatness, my friend. It has to do with how we think. So we've got to think right. Okay. Now that leads us up to this kind of conclusion before Paul transitions into some of the sin problems in the church. first problem in the church was how they thought about men. They really spent 
this whole portion all the way up to chapter 5 where chapter 5 begins correcting their thinking and explaining why the way you think isn't right. One last thing he mentions though in chapter 4 is this matter of the position that the believers at Corinth are in and the, versus the position that he and the other apostles are in. And I want to ask some questions, and I don't know if you've ever thought about this before, but I have. Anybody here ever been afraid to die? Anybody just be honest, they're a little afraid to die. How about not being afraid to die, but afraid to die painfully? Okay? Uh, <laughs> in other words, how many of you would, would rather just go to bed at night, everything's fine, and then you just never wake up in the morning? That's... That's the dream for everybody, right? As far as, I want to be raptured. And I want to do my Superman move in the rapture. Uh, so I'm hoping for that. But if that doesn't happen for me, uh, if I had my druthers, in other words, if I could do what I'd rather do, I would rather uh, just die in my sleep. I'd rather go to bed at night and kiss my wife and say, I'll see you in heaven or in the morning, one or the other, and then just go to heaven. Make, you know, go ahead and do that. And that'd be fine, okay? So that'd be the, that would be ideal, but you ever, you ever see the way some people have to die? Mm. I don't want to be graphic this evening, so I'm not going to. But the reality of it is that for the cause of Jesus Christ, in the last week, people have died. Gruesome, terrible. People have been put to death because they believe in Jesus. I'm going into details, but tells about a man just killed a few weeks ago, and uh, he was told to renounce Christ. He did renounce Christ. And then they said, you know, then they killed him in a terrible way. Uh, I think probably it would be the difference between in the Middle East, a lot of times we talk about Christians and Muslims. We're talking about Christians, we're talking about either Catholics or uh, Coptic Christians. They're not people who have been born again, they're people who are politically they're over there, and I'm here, and they are born a Christian and get put to death for it. Now, you're, I, I, now, let's assume they're born again Christians. And they are being persecuted for it. And I'm here, and this evening, I'm actually in a country that if the government came in and shut down our church, there would actually be some outrage. There would actually be some recourse. Of course, this evening, we actually have a legal right to worship God here. You say, Pastor, we're losing our rights. I know all that. I, I have my thoughts. This is what I have thought. This is, this is the discovery that I've made. This is what I've determined. He said, I think that God hath set us, set forth us the apostles last as they were appointed to them. Now think about being the apostle Paul just for a minute. I don't think they had, this is what I think, okay? <laughs> I don't think they had benches in prison. Can you remember Paul and Silas being in prison? Remember what happened to them before they went to prison? Got beaten. They were beaten. Literally beaten almost within an inch of their lives. Literally beaten almost to the point of death. Terrible beating. And then they were in prison and they were in chains. And at midnight they sang praises to God. Do you ever uh, you ever realize that it wasn't natural for Paul either to sing praise to God? Ever thought about that? You thought, man, he was just such a super guy. I mean, it's such a puzzle. Paul beat him up and he sings. He's like a music box. You punch him and he praises. Wind him up and let him go. Silas was the same way. That's just the way those guys were made. God made them that way. Apostle Paul said, I can't. He actually thought about it. You ever wonder, if, you know, he was in prison more than once. You ever wonder if he ever thought, why am I here? He did. He thought about it. And he shares his thoughts about it. You know, you ever wonder if the Apostle Paul had thought, you know what? How come John gets to be the one that's boiled in oil and exiled to Patmos and die a natural death? <laughs> As though that's a life you want. <laughs> but I, you now you know how I think, okay? Um, you ever think the Apostle Paul might have thought about that? I think he did. Peter did. The Lord Jesus said, if, if I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? Feed my sheep. Peter, mind your own business. Do what you're called to do. Feed my sheep. But he thought about it. Paul get a nasty letter from Corinth saying, you know what, your letters are weighty and powerful, but your bodily presence is weak and your speech is worse than weak. It's contemptible. In other words, you're not much of a guy when you're 
you're standing with us. You're off a big man and when you write a letter, but you're not so big when you show up in town. These are people that he's led to Jesus Christ. And he's loved. He's prayed for. They write him a nasty letter. You ever wonder if you ever thought anything about that? He said, I think. It's interesting, isn't it? You know what he came to the conclusion of? He said, I think that it might just be what I'm called to do. It might be that the folks over at Corinth are ex experiencing almost no physical persecution in their lives. They're actually living a life of relative ease and comfort while I'm being beaten. Look what he says happens to him. Verse 11, he says, Even unto this present hour, we both hunger and thirst. Paul says, right now, if I had something to eat, I would eat it. But I don't have anything. I'm hungry. He said, I we're thirsty. He said, if I had something to drink right now, at this minute, if there were something for me to drink, I'd drink it, but I don't have it. Literally, he has lack in his life. He says, uh, in the same statement, he says that we're naked. And buffeted. literally, uh, he's cold. He lacks the clothing that he needs. Buffeted. Literally, the, the idea of buffeted is beaten. He says, this hour, I was struck because I'm an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's his position. You ever wonder whether or not he ever thought, Lord, wouldn't it be nicer if you called me to live in Corinth with the people that aren't really persecuted so much? They're kind of wealthy. they got houses to live in. You'd be amazed what wealth is in comparison when you're hungry and thirsty and naked and buffeted. You'd be amazed at what would be comfort. Paul says, I think that God set us forth the apostles last as they were appointed. He said, you know what I think? God, I think God wants me to die. I think that's my call. Before he said, now you see your calling, brethren, how that not many mighty, not many noble, not many... And he goes on to describe the people are called, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world. And Paul said, I think that my calling is to be beaten to death. And he goes on to point out, he said, for we are made a spectacle unto the world and to angels and to men. Literally, our lives are put up on display as almost a spectacular bad example. You didn't see the Apostle Paul say, oh man, I want to be an Apostle. See, there wasn't any movie to uh, make it look good or glamorous. There was nothing glamorous about being an Apostle at all. He did not even have the due respect that the church should have given him. We have to think of men more highly than we have to think. Paul said, here he's kind of preaching, kind of preaching the message that he's preached to himself. You see this? He said, I actually realized that I think God has called me to live this kind of a life. This is what God wants in my life. And he said, this, he said, we're fools for Christ's sake. Literally, from man's perspective, what you do is dumb. Paul wants you to give it up. If you'd stop traveling and make a tent in a safe place, if you'd stop going to these places and preaching the gospel and thinking that you've got to save the world, you wouldn't have to go through this. He said, we're fools for Christ's sake. Literally, people think I'm an idiot. I use that word twice a week. Yeah. He said, we are weak. Literally, people say, well, you know, what can you do? He said, we're weak. And then he contrasts it with them. He said, but ye are strong. He said, ye are honorable, but we are despised. Literally, you can go out in public and people treat you with respect, and yet when they see me, they think of, you ever think of what Paul must have been treated like? If you saw Paul, you would not have thought, here's royalty. You'd have thought, what has this guy done to himself? Why does, he, why does he look like this? You know how many times he was beaten? What do you think the chances are he had any teeth? I'm not joking. I'm not being silly this evening. Seriously, what are the chances Paul had teeth? What are the chances his nose was straight? What are the chances he didn't have scars all across his body? 
How do you think he walked? You think I'm Kempe. I've never even been beaten. Literally, when you saw him, you just think, boy, hard living. Why would anyone want to live like that? Several years ago, I listened to a testimony on the radio of a man who became a millionaire by picking up trash at Walmart. Got the contracts at Walmart. He said, he, at the point, he was a millionaire, and he overheard he was actually cleaning up in front of a Walmart, and then overheard a mom say to her son, you want to grow up and be doing that? And he's like, thinking I'm a millionaire? But he's still working. He was picking up trash. He's not watching. You know, you better go to school. You better, you better behave, or you're going to end up growing up and being like that guy. You know, he was a millionaire being despised because he was picking up trash. So he made his millions. Wayne and Isaac and did the same thing. Picking up trash. And the Apostle Paul was in the day, the man who God was most mightily using. And if you'd seen him in public, you'd have said, whatever that guy did, you don't want to do. You see how different it is when God calls us? You see how different it is when we are what He wants us to be than oftentimes what we think we should be? What we think about people. My friend, if you'd looked at Paul, you wouldn't have thought much. That's what I'm saying this evening. He knew it. He was explaining it to the church at Corinth. He said, I'm not much. Because God has called me to be a spectacle. God has called me to be a fool. God has called me to be despised for His sake. And that's my calling. That's what I think. You know the beauty of this statement here? You start thinking, man, better Him than me. You know what you're thinking? Don't just... Let's be honest about it. Better him than me, right? How would you like to serve God and have people look down on you? Well, why don't they just move out of there? Why does he have to go there? I'll tell you why the Apostle Paul preached the Gospels and the Gospel places he was beaten. He preached the Gospels so the people there could be saved. So they could come to Jesus Christ. See, he did what was necessary because it needed to be done. It was his calling. Yet anyone with any kind of reason or common sense, as far as the world thinks, would have said that's foolish. You see it this evening, Christian? See, the way we think sometimes, I think, would hinder us from being what God wants us to be because we'd say, oh, anyway, they did that's a fool. What's your attitude? How do you think? See, when you start thinking a man is this, or a man is this, you're thinking all wrong. What you need to think is, I what God wants me to be. How am I going to stand when I stand before God? How will it be when the things that I've done in my life are burned? Is this what God wants for me? And in so much that you take it upon yourself to judge the lives of others, you ought to ask the same questions for that. Because I believe Paul was beaten because God wanted him to. I believe he was buffeted because God wanted him to be. He was despised because God wanted him to be. This is Paul thought. He goes on to point out this. He says there. He said, we labor. He said, in this present hour, he said, we labor working with our hands. Being reviled, we bless. Being persecuted, we suffer. Now, he's not bragging here, but he's, he's pointing out the attitude that has come because of the way that he thinks. Now, when he is reviled, somebody curses him, puts him down, his response is to bless them. Somebody sees Paul in the streets, get out of here, you stinking, filthy bum. I don't want you in this town. I'm going to see you here again. And Paul's thought is, I'd like to see you in heaven. And it's my prayer that you'll come to know Jesus as your Savior and God's love and how much God has for you, my friend. He doesn't even have a thought toward the person's attitude toward him. His concern is that they know that Jesus loves them and wants them to be born again. Being revived, we bless. He said, uh, being persecuted, we suffer. It just takes it. It just allows it. The idea of suffer is we allow it. In other words, when someone tries to persecute us and give us hardship, we just take it. And you know where some of Paul's persecution came from, unfortunately? It came from letters written to him by the church of Corinth. 
It came from responses of people that he had sent to Corinth as messengers. And he had ministered to them, and their response was to persecute him. And he said, we take it. We suffer. That's tough, isn't it? That's a good reminder of what humility actually is. Humility is not thinking that you or I are less than somebody else or acting as though that's what we think. It's realizing we actually are. Humility, humility is just realizing I'm, I'm nothing. That's the reality. God loves them so much that if I'm going to love them the way that Jesus Christ did, then I'll just be their servant, and servant is not greater than the Lord. If you serve somebody, you're nothing. Well, I'm not, I wouldn't let anyone talk to me like that. Why not? Paul said, when people talk to me that way, I'm just like he goes on to say this, being defamed and treat, we are made as the filth of the world and are the offscouring of all things unto this day. There's no honor in the life of the Apostle Paul. Is that surprising a little bit sometimes? You ever read the Scripture and, you, and, and the way the Holy Spirit used Paul ministered in your life so much that you stop, man, God, thank you for using Paul the way that you did. And you really thought honorable thoughts for Paul. Well, that didn't happen when he was alive. For though ye have ten, he said this though, and here's here's how we're supposed to think. He said, I write not these things to shame you, but as my beloved sons, I warn you. What's the warning? What's the warning? Verse 6. These things, brethren, I have in a figure transferred to myself and to Apollos for your sakes, that you may learn in us not to think of men above that which is written, that no one of you be puffed up for one against another. Well, so I'm not telling you this so that you can feel sorry for me. I'm not telling you this so that you can suffer in my place. I'm not feel, telling you this so that you can correct some wrong in my calling. <clears throat> I'm telling you this as a warning that you don't respect men's persons. Christian, how much does God love the person sitting next to you? How much? How much does God love the people that pass by this street on a daily basis? How much does God love the person who disrespected you at the store today? So much that Jesus died on the cross for their sin. So much God loves them. And He loves them a lot. And if that's the way that God thinks about them, how do I value them? Well, God probably loves him about here. God probably loves him about here. No, 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 no. God loves him so do I. God loves him so do I. That's how we think. Okay, here's the question, though. Oh, he says, that's why I beseech you in verse 16, be followers of me. He said, listen, when I ask you to do what I say, it's not so that you can hold me in respect mm -hmm. or reverence. Because I want to help you with that thing. I feel almost privileged, or guilty to be privileged sometimes. Sometimes people misunderstand when I say I haven't been through terrible, great hardship in my life, which is really the truth. Sometimes I think, well, pastors had the easy life and I've had the hard life. Well, that may not necessarily be true. It may be that some of the things that have happened in my life have been more of a hardship than some of the things that have happened in your life. But that when you compare yourself with the Apostle Paul, you just have to say, I don't thank you very much. Sometimes people's response is simply to say, well, you know what, you just don't understand. You've never been through anything. You never, you never had a hardship. The reality of it is, is that comparatively speaking, probably none of us have really suffered so terribly. None of us have really had terrible hardship when you compare yourself to men like Paul and Paulus and Peter and so forth. You just haven't had such a hard life. And sometimes I feel a little guilty about that. I feel as though, oh, why, why haven't I had a hard life? I'll tell you this, if you feel too much guilt, why don't you pray and ask God for one? <laughs> just pray, say, God, I just... 
if I'm under conviction for living so easy, would you just bring me hardship? That'll be the day you get fired and your house burns down, lose your job, and get kidnapped and sent to Saudi Arabia. How are we supposed to think, Christian? God, thank you for this day. Thanks for this day. Lord, today I'm yours. God, whatever you want me to be today is what I want to be. I want to be careful today that I don't respect men, men's persons. I don't think of men more highly than I ought to think. I want to be careful today that I do not follow a personality, but that I just obey your word and your son. God, today I just want to think the way that Jesus did when He went to the cross willingly. I want to recognize the value of a soul. Lord, I don't know what You saw in me and why You saved me, but I know You love me and I know You love others, and so I want to love others. And then you can just say, thank You, Lord, for men like Paul. Thank You for people and places who are faithful to Your Word and preaching the Gospel. And God, be with them today. And Lord, if there's anything You want me to do to bear their burdens, Lord, that's what I want. I want to be part of that. I want to be what I'm supposed to be. You know, if you're what you're supposed to be, friend, and if God wants you to go through hardship, He will, and He'll have His grace, and you'll just think about it the way Paul does. Well, I think I'm supposed to be a spectacle. That's what I think. That's what Paul's conclusion was. Is he bothered? Is he troubled about it? He said, am I telling you this so that you can you know, feel badly about my position or who I am? No. I'm just trying to explain to you how things are. Be careful judging people in their place that God has called them. You know, sometimes, sometimes when people are from other countries, sometimes we uh, honor or dishonor them on the basis of their background and so forth. We just think more of people from some places than other places. You meet someone that's a little bit backward or ignorant or uneducated, you just don't think that much about them. And uh, when you meet somebody who's maybe a little more <laughs> don't point it, that's not nice. You meet somebody who is, you know, a little more advanced and has a little more knowledge of whatever you think about them. Friend, that isn't your duty. It isn't your task. It isn't your position. You know, as a church, one of the things we have to be very careful about is thinking about people the way Jesus does. Somebody comes to this church, you ought to be honored. I don't care who they are, just be honored. They walk in the door, you ought to say, you know, it's an honor. I'm not talking about tell them it's an honor. You ought to think, what? I'm honored they came to you. They came to fellowship with us. You know why? They didn't have to do that. They didn't have to be here with us. Somebody trusts Jesus as their Savior, you ought to be just thrown to death for them. Somebody isn't quite as intelligent as you are. Maybe, maybe you know, they only know 25 letters of the alphabet or something. You know 26. You just don't think much about it. If they're what God wants them to be, and you're what God wants them to be, then just think, well, you know what, they're what God wants them to be, and I'm what I'm supposed to be. That's all that matters. Here's the question, Christian. Are you what God wants you to be? Are you what God wants you to be? Where you live, is that where God wants you to live? Your ministry, is that the ministry God has called you to? There are some things we know for sure. You know for sure that where you're born is the place God wanted you to be born. To be born. You know for sure that God wants you to be born again. You know for sure that God wants you to share Jesus with every person that you possibly can. You know that if you are what God wants you to be, He'll lead you into the place that you're supposed to end up. So what about you? what God wants you to be? But think about that. Don't be thinking about people. Put people up, put people down. It's not your job. We're all going to stand before Christ. And Paul said, he said, I don't think of, I don't really think anything at all about you judging me. He said, I don't even think about how I'll be judged myself. He said, I'll find out. When I stand before God, I'm going to be held in account. He said, I haven't judged myself yet because I don't know what God knows. The day will come when it will be revealed and it will be shown. And every person is going to be tried for what they are. We need to live for them. Father, help us. Help us. Help us.